Howdy. Howdy. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's really a pleasure to see you all here. It's great again to be doing events in person and this event tonight is really a great uh, opportunity to interact with some of the amazing speakers and thinkers of our time. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Raymond Robertson. I'm the director of the Mossbacker Institute at the Bush School of Government and Public Service. And again, I wanna thank you all very much for coming out and spending tonight with us. We'd like to welcome you to the event, of course, which is assessing Chinese and Russian influence in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is part of the other side of the border, ties that bind and issues that divide speaker series that really features practitioners working on the border and Mexico and throughout Latin America. We owe a huge amount of gratitude to our sponsors tonight, so I'd like to just thank them explicitly. So obviously we're really excited to hear from two of the leading Latin American experts. Uh, we're really excited, but first we'd like to recognize and thank the Mossbacker Institute's co-sponsor for the event, which is the Carlos H. Cantu uh, Education Opportunity Endowment, directed by Dr. Felipe Hinojosa. Uh, the Cantu Endowment enables researchers, community leaders, and educators to come together to address Latino, Latina education in the state and in the nation. So we want to thank you so much for making this possible tonight. I'd also like to recognize another great partner of ours, which is Dr. Robert Holzweitz, right, who's here in the front row. Uh, who's the acting director of the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum, and who's been a wonderful figure in our community and really an anchor for all of us. We want to thank you so much for everything you've done and making this such a great place. He actually brought in a very special guest as well, who's Kara Bond, um, who's the director of the National Archives of Presidential Libraries. We're so honored that you made time to spend with us tonight, and we're really excited that you're here. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, of course, uh, probably one of the most important people here tonight is Dr. Eileen Teague, and I'd like to address, uh, introduce her and thank her very much for everything that she's done. She's the series organizer, and um, she's been working, obviously, with the Mossbacker Institute, and we have a border and migration program that really, to be completely frank, is holding Eileen as the keystone as this project. So uh, that wouldn't be happening without her. But what, the, what we're trying to do with that program is to produce multidisciplinary research on the impacts of migration and economic uh, international flows across the border, trade, finance, as well as migration, and enhance evidence-driven policymaking uh, and community engagement. Um, for those of you who don't know Professor Teague yet, I mean, she's one of our stars here at the Bush School. She joined the Bush School's Department of International Affairs as an assistant professor in the fall of 2020. She previously held a post, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at Brown University's Watson Institute uh, for International Public Affairs and earned her PhD in history from Vanderbilt University in 2018. Born in Cologne, Panama, uh, she traveled the world as part of a military family and served in the US Marine Corps. I've heard her say many times, my beloved Marines. Um, <laughs> made a big impact on her from 2006 to 2014. She teaches some of our classes uh, in American history and US relations with Mexico and Latin America, as well as thematic courses addressing issues such as interventionism, drug enforcement, national security, and addiction in US society. She um, always enjoys providing a voice on how history has shaped and continues to shape current social and political issues. It's such an honor for me personally and for the Mossbacker Institute to be working with her on the speaker series. She's been doing an amazing job, as you'll see tonight, uh, to shed light on these very important issues about migration and the border. So with no further ado, I'd like to thank Eileen and welcome her up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond, and good evening to you all. I also want to express my gratitude to Jennifer Moore, Cindy Gauze, and one of our graduate students here, Ashley Falzoy, from the Mossbacher Institute for expertly coordinating every aspect of this event. Thank you so much for all of your efforts, ladies. Um, and welcome to our special visitors from the Bush Library, to those of you joining us on Zoom, um, and to all of you uh, for joining us to discuss Chinese and Russian influence in Latin America. It's no secret that over the last 15 years, Chinese influence has quickly expanded across Latin America. Beijing's military leaders visited their counterparts 215 times between 2002 and 2019 with Chile, Cuba, Brazil, and Argentina accounting for more than half of these visits. This comes as the 33-member Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, or CELAC, the most important 
mode for China's engagement with the Caribbean on an array of issues from defense to disaster response, agreed to continue military collaborations through the China-Latin America High-Level Defense Forum. Chinese military engagement in our hemisphere is betrayed by its economic power. Since 2018, when Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative was extended to Latin America, 10 governments in the region signed on. Chinese companies are pouring billions of dollars into infrastructure and development in the region. Traditionally conceived of by policymakers in the United States as its backyard, though this is rapidly changing as we're gonna find out tonight, Latin America has had a complicated relationship with Washington, especially across the 20th century. Chinese and to a lesser extent Russian influence draws parallels to the Cold War days when Soviet military aid to places like Cuba or the fear of Moscow-backed guerrilla insurgencies intensified and made more violent Washington's policies in the region. Then, one could argue, as is the case now, superpower rivalry threatens to take the driver's seat in US relations with Latin America. This is a topic that my colleague, Professor John Schusler, who's here with us tonight and I have been interested in and part of what motivated uh, bringing in the speakers and this event tonight. So what should Washington do about the Chinese and the Russians in the Western Hemisphere, especially considering the mixed messages we receive in the media of how much China is entrenched in the Western Hemisphere? This is where our special guests come in, Mr. Juan Cruz and Dr. Evan Ellis, and I delay no further in introducing them to you as part of our special panel on this topic this evening. Mr. Juan Cruz joined the Center for Strategic and International Studies in 2019 as non-resident senior advisor. Since October 2020, he has also served as director of the Argentina U.S. Strategic Forum. From 2017 to 2019, Mr. Cruz worked with the National Security Council as the special assistant to the president and senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs. He drove interagency decision-making processes for the region and worked with international partners to foster shared understanding of key issues. Mr. Cruz was instrumental in defining the administration's approach to the Venezuelan crisis, the administration's Cuba policy, and furthering the overall Western Hemisphere strategy. Since then, he has advised the private and public sectors to include foreign governments as well as multilateral institutions, um, like the Organization of American States uh, on issues um, throughout the region. Mr. Cruz's professional career spans three decades as a public servant in US government. His deep understanding of the political and security issues in Latin America was honed through official overseas postings in Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Panama, Peru, and Venezuela. Dr. Evan Ellis is a research professor of Latin American studies at the US Army War College Strategic Studies Institute with a focus on the region's relationships with China and other non-Western Hemisphere actors, as well as transnational organized crime and populism in the region. I'll say that one cannot explore the topic of the Chinese and the Russians in Latin America without coming across Dr. Ellis's work. He has published over 400 works, including five books, most recently the 2022 book, China Engages Latin America, Distorting Development and Democracy. Dr. Ellis previously served as the Secretary of State's Policy Planning Staff with responsibility for Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as international narcotics and law enforcement issues. Um, in his academic capacity, Dr. Ellis has presented his work in a broad range of business and government forums in 27 countries and four continents. He has given testimony in Latin American security issues to the US Congress on various occasions, has discussed his work regarding China and other external actors in Latin America on a broad range of, uh, of radio and television programs, and is cited regularly in the print media in both the US and Latin America for his help in the area. Um, a note on submitting questions. Um, the way that this is gonna work with the panel is I will ask both speakers some initial questions and then invite you all to submit your questions electronically. I will be receiving questions on my iPad here via the QR code that is on your program. If you have any trouble using the QR code, the ambassadors in the Navy jackets which are with us, who are with us here tonight would be happy to help you, so just kind of signal for their attention. Um, without further ado, please help me welcome to the Bush School uh, Mr. Juan Cruz and Dr. Evan Ellis.
All right, I'll do a quick test test. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Okay, well, I wanna just jump in because there's a lot of aspects to cover on this topic. And to kind of start with a baseline topic, I mean, we've been talking about this topic all day in different forums and different classrooms, but let's just start simple here in asking, what does every American need to know about the Chinese and the Russians in Latin America that we might not know right now? Uh, if you permit me, I think the first thing I would do is um, talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, the reason we're here. I'm going to give a little, my commentary is going to be a little heavy on China, a little less so on Russia, and I want to be provocative from the start and say the reason for that is perhaps we should be thinking of um, Russia's uh, fixation right now on the war in the Ukraine might give an opportunity and present uh, China with the opportunity to be Russia's proxy in the region for these issues. And so it's, um, it's an interesting way to look at it. I don't think we've had enough evidence yet, but it's something that um, we should be looking at. And anyway, um, I'd like to model maybe something from, um, from our, how we conduct business in, in Washington, which is read a lot of documents, a lot of memorandum. And so it's oftentimes we see um, more commonly at the beginning of all documents, uh, the first line in bold says bluff. And bluff meaning bottom line up front. And if there's anything that you really want to know of, of this material, it should be distilled in this one sentence. And I think what I would like to leave you with in, in my commentary today is um, think of it as China may not be as bad as you think it is yet. And with that, I would, I, I'd like to talk maybe about a few myths it's okay with you. A few myths about China and the region and how we can uh, often get it right or wrong, or the region gets it right or wrong. And the first one um, has to do with uh, perceptions, and it is we are asking countries to choose the U.S. or China. Pick a side. Dodgeball, pick somebody on your team, and another version of this is don't trade with China. Now this, is, of course, is a myth. In, the, um, in my experience with the Trump administration, we had a very high-level meeting, engaged the six largest economies in the region, senior members. We sat down, we talked about three, by the way, at that time of the six, three of them, the primary trading partner was China. The other three, uh, it was the United States. Today, it's four and two. And at the time, the, uh, the United States, we tried to explain to them all the things that you've heard, the, the arguments, and they rang pretty shallow, especially because the U.S.'s primary trading partner is China. So myth number one, you know, don't do business with China. Myth number two, China is displacing U.S. companies, and especially in infrastructure. And that's unfortunately not true. If you look, the data shows U.S. companies left the region well before China arrived, and we can get into this in the question and answer period, but who did they displace? The Canadians and the Spaniards and the South Koreans and the Argentines and Odebrecht from Brazil, and we know how that played out in the region with uh, corruption scandals involving Odebrecht. So the Chinese actually displace others. So the myth that somehow they're displacing U.S. companies. Um, and there's, well, the third myth, myth is that we, um, there is a great risk in adopting Chinese technology and communications, right? That's what these, the countries look at us and say, is there really a risk? And is there any more risk than if we engage in that technology with someone else, particularly the US? And so they look at the cases of um, Assange and um, Edward Snowden. And they say, if our information isn't vulnerable through the Chinese, it would be vulnerable to the US or, another, or, or to the US, US or others. Um, Myth number four, good over evil will prevail. Our argument is that we wear the white hats, they wear the black hats. We support democracy and human rights and we have common values. And of course, um, uh, the, the, the Chinese are repressive and so forth. And um, quite honestly, that, and we have proven that that ends up not winning the day. There are a lot of reasons for that. Again, we can get into it. Democracy has lost lots of its enthusiasm in the region, unfortunately. And then fifth, that the Chinese presence in the region is bad. And 
we need to scratch the surface on that. The Chinese offer opportunities that if they play by the rules, they avoid corruption, they do a good, a good job, and they win what they have fair and square, that there's a role for them in infrastructure in Latin America where, like in the US, uh, it's aged and it needs refurbishment. We do need new infrastructure in Latin America. So if the Chinese can follow the rules, the rules that would apply to everyone, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Of course, we need increased trade and commerce in the region, especially after the, um, these economies recovering from the uh, COVID period and the pandemic. And then lastly, I would offer to you that if in a country like Argentina needed a bullet train to go from Tierra del Fuego, from the southern part of Patagonia in the country to the north of Salta, and the Chinese were going to follow the rules, and this was going to meaningfully improve Argentine's development and its economy, why would we be against that? And lastly, or conversely, that China is harmless. And that's a myth. Because when many see our accusations as being uh, foundless, what we know, and I'll just tick off, China represents a risk or a threat in espionage, corruption, the protection of the environment, protection of democracy, um, unfair trade practices, illegal fishing, and um, against our sovereignty. So I wanted to make sure I was able to talk a little bit about the myths as a foundation for uh, some of the commentary tonight, so thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ellis? Sure, um, let me give a little bit of a baseline here and, and let me uh, start out by talking about uh, you know, China, Russia, other actors such, such as Iran, um, and we often also uh, overlook is other uh, what I would call like-minded democratic and, and, and other actors, uh, whether uh, Japan, Korea, India, the European Union, et cetera. But especially when we talk about China, Russia, Iran, it's important to recognize that the motivations, the level of involvement, the breadth of involvement in, in the style of each of those actors are different. Sometimes they are complementary, sometimes they're they're in conflict. But um, to talk mostly about China, to provide a little bit of a baseline, uh, of course, uh, what we've seen is the evolution of that engagement. Uh, so um, it, it really became most notable in uh, after China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. Uh, so we're up to the point in which uh, China is now the, the number one trading partner of virtually every nation in the region uh, south of Costa Rica, uh, with a total of about uh, $450 billion in, in bilateral trade, depending on whose figures you use. Um, in addition, uh, in about 2010, as Chinese companies especially the SOEs became uh, more experienced. You got to the point uh, of investing a total of about uh, $173 billion in, in the region, uh, in addition to uh, loans from Chinese policy banks, such as China Exim Bank and China Development Bank. Um, but that uh, presence on the ground, not only in construction projects, but actually investing, oftentimes through mergers and acquisitions, uh, but sometimes in telecommunications, building a presence from the ground up, uh, really uh, created a, a, a feeling of, of China as an employer, um, as as a, as, as, a, as a local uh, player, uh, sometimes for good, sometimes for, for bad. Uh, the question is often, well, what is China looking for? And what I would argue is that uh, China is essentially looking for its own principally economic interests uh, in terms of uh, reliable access to, um, to uh, commodities and, and food stuff that it needs to feed the Chinese people. It's looking for access to markets. It's looking to move up the technology uh, value-added chain, but oftentimes in, in strategic ways uh, using its, its government and, and SOEs uh, in order to capture as much of the value added as possible for its, its own um, companies and people. And in the process, it's transforming the region, not only economically, but it's also transforming the, the discourse because as China um, becomes uh, increasingly important in, in the region, uh, what people are willing to say in the region, critical of, of China in the hopes of attracting China as, as a, a partner or at least getting access to the Chinese market, it really mutes the discourse in the region just as it mutes that discourse in, in the United States. Um, at the same time, it also changes the political trajectory in, in the region. So you have uh, some actors, uh, China is as well known, uh, is uh, you know, very willing to deal with both uh, uh, well-institutionalized democratic actors uh, such as the Chileans, um, but it's also willing to uh, give things or, or deal with uh, com uh, countries uh, such as populist authoritarian regimes, uh, Venezuela, uh, Ecuador previous under Rafael Correa, um, uh, Bolivia under Evo Morales, uh, very 
very assured in making sure that it structures the contracts in, in terms to make sure that it gets paid, however much those populist regimes may nationalize or, or mistreat to other, other countries. And in the process, um, in terms of the economic interactions, the resources, that has given some of those regimes a new lease on life as, as they move to consolidate their own, um, you know, their control over their own people. Uh, but at the same time, it's also implemented uh, you know, certain types of, of uh, support in terms of, of information architectures and other things that also help those authoritarian regimes to, to stay in power. Now, when we take a look at the character of the relationship, we can recognize that as China moves in the resource sector, that also includes uh, strategic minerals such, such as lithium um, and, and uh, of course, things like niobium, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it also includes, in terms of, of access to uh, in terms of access to, uh, to, to, to resources and markets, um, a concentration on what I, would, what I would call the global connectivity of, of Latin America. So you've probably heard a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative, and it is true that since Panama uh, turned and recognized China in 2017, that you now have 21 countries across the region that have signed up to Belt and Road, although really China's what they call Global Development Initiative is, is now the, the point of emphasis, as well as the Global Security Initiative, of which hopefully I think we'll talk about later. But in addition to, uh, to, to that, um, what, you, what you find is there's a focus on, on things like control of ports, control of, of the electricity sector, so especially green uh, energy uh, generation and, and transmission companies like State Grid, companies like uh, SPIC, companies like China Three Gorges, which are involved, uh, have been involved in countries like, like Brazil, but also Chile. Uh, for example, uh, China now owns over 57% of electricity generation and transmission in Chile, which has a, a free market electricity sector, j just to provide an example. But also in the digital space, uh, although we talk a lot about the Huawei and 5G, frankly, China has been developing its presence uh, since the late uh, 1990s. Uh, so you now have 3G, 4G, 5G. You have uh, Huawei building data centers in which it encourages China to, um, in which it encourages uh, Latin American startups to put their intellectual property in the Huawei cloud. You have um, you have uh, various different fintech uh, applications, and so it, really uh, China is in position to pursue its own uh, interests by controlling the strategic connectivity of Latin American economies. Um, but just to close, I also I would point out that it's not just about the economics. China is very engaged in both the multilateral and um, in bilateral space. It very actively uses free trade agreements to pursue those, those objectives to open up uh, th those countries. Um, most recently, of course, uh, um, uh, 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 Ecuador, um, which uh, just completed a free trade agreement, Uruguay, which is uh, going in, in that direction. Um, El Salvador, which might soon be moving in that direction. Of course, uh, multilaterally through CELAC, the Chinese are consummate bureaucrats. And so uh, Eileen had mentioned, of course, the, the China CELAC Defense Forum. And so um, what you find is whether it's the Defense Forum, whether it's the Disaster Release Forum, whether it's the Space Forum, China is very active in engaging uh, in, in the space domain, which creates a number of, of strategic as well as commercial issues. Uh, China is uh, very effective in, in using the, those forums to pursue its, its interest. I mean, now, of course, as we move beyond COVID-19 uh, and uh, China moves beyond its own zero COVID policy, what we see uh, with already the, the prospects for, um, for, for China to engage in the region with the just canceled uh, but likely renewed uh, visit by, by Lula da Silva in, in, in Brazil, uh, the likely upcoming visit with, with Xiomara Castro as, as Honduras becomes the latest uh, state that, that has flipped, um, as we look at the prospects for Gustavo Petro to, to travel to China later this year, uh, Gabriel Boric of Chile to travel, and the possibility that Xi Jinping will actually travel to, to the region. I think what we see is um, that uh, we're moving into a period in which um, as we focus more attention on this in Washington, that there's going to be a lot of activity, both commercially and, and politically, um, that will continue to, to stimulate the discourse about what the nature of the threat is and, frankly, what the tools are at our disposal to, to respond. Fantastic. We have a lot of questions coming in, which is very encouraging. And what I want to do, I mean, we were covering security issues, um, global uh, currency issues. And of course, I definitely want to jump into the subject of uh, Lula da Silva's recent, recent visit to Washington versus his proposed visit to China. But what I want to do is uh, pose one question to you, Dr. Ellis, um, to answer. Uh, and then I have a, a separate question that I'd like to pose to, to Mr. Cruz. And um, the first question very clearly comes from probably Professor Debris' class, um, who you all sat in just a, a little earlier today. Um, and bear with me for one second. All of these questions are, are, are coming in very quickly. Um, but according to General Van Herc, commander of NORAD and NORTHCOM, and this question is for you, Dr. Ellis, there are more Russian GRU agents in Mexico than any other country in the world. 
However, China's MSS and other intelligence community actors' presence in Latin America is less known. How much influence or action do China's intelligence services commit in the region? That's a great question. Um, so, uh, as, you, as you understand, uh, during the Cold War, of course, uh, you know, Russia has that, that infrastructure. And going back to the time of Luis Echeverria in, in Mexico and others, uh, you know, Russia has long time you know, had that, that experience. Um, and to this day, in many ways, as Russia re-engages the region, especially since 2007, uh, you uh, have Russia trying to re-activate uh, some of those networks. And yet, its, it's economic basis um, and, and the resources to, to do so are, are limited, especially now as um, you know, its ability to do so has been a bit frozen out. Uh, as a consequence of the Ukraine. Uh, in general, what you find with, with China is that although, uh, you know, uh, especially with its, its security services, it was unknown. China has been very effective in, in two areas. Number one, through its people-to-people -people diplomacy, and number two, uh, through its, its, its digital capabilities. So in people-to-people, -people, what you find is through the um, approximately 44 Confucius Institutes that you have in the region, which serve as, as gatekeepers, but also through the types of trips that the Chinese regularly do, um, sponsoring some of Latin America's China-interested elites to, to come over to China in on on Hanban scholarships, um, which then uh, you know, those students uh, go back speaking Mandarin, um, and oftentimes are the ones that that, that capture their uh, their country's um, you know, foreign foreign affairs, foreign ministry, trade promotion organization uh, slots representing their countries before China. But oftentimes there are trips by uh, China's leading uh, you know, Latin America's leading intellectuals that you're know, studying. Uh, but oftentimes trips by Congress people, tri uh, uh, trips by military personnel. Uh, so you have the National Defense University in, in Champing that has a short courses, three to five week courses that bring over those military officials. So it's about developing those relationships, um, but also in the region, of course, as China has built up its, its architectures. It's also developed not only the ability to work in the region, of course, so with the expanding footprint of, of Chinese companies, uh, but also in the digital domain. As, as I mentioned before, um, uh, under uh, the 2017 Chinese national security law, uh, what you have is the obligation of, of companies such as Huawei uh, to turn over any uh, material that, that's relevant uh, to national security. And so as you have the increasing ubiquitous uh, nature of, of those things, we've, we've already seen uh, Chinese um uh, Chinese uh, involved in at least uh, deniable hacking activities and, and things like that, uh, but also recognizing that, that so much of the architecture, about 60%, for example, the telecommunication architecture in Latin America is constructed by Huawei or, or ZTE or, or others. So many that the telephones are, you know, if not Huawei, they're Xiaomi, they're Oppo, they're, they're other Chinese phones. Um, you have uh, you know Chinese ride-sharing applications, uh, such as, for example, Didi Chuxong, which is actually competing with Uber in the, in the ride-sharing space. You have um, you have companies like uh, like uh, Jack, Jack Ma's, um, you know, uh, uh, you know Al Al Alibaba, which is very good with, with business to business. And so the opportunity, and of course, the security systems companies like, like Heat Vision, like, like Dahua, uh, some of the smart cities and safe cities architectures. And so the issue is that although uh, China is relatively new to um, Latin America is relatively new to China, but especially in the past about 10 years as Chinese companies has been on the, the, the ground in the region, that the opportunities uh, not only through people-to-people -people diplomacy, but in the digital space to gain that information. And frankly, the Chinese approach of using large numbers of sometimes clumsy but, uh, but adaptive in learning approaches to get the information that they need, I think are, are allowing the, the Chinese to kind of make up some of the breach that they had vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the Russians who had been in the region for a long time. Fantastic. Um, Mr. Cruz, I want to switch over to, to Brazil and um, talk about uh, President um, Luis uh, Inácio Lula da Silva, who visited Washington for one day to visit President Biden in, in February. Um, he was then scheduled to visit China for a six-day trip, which it's been rescheduled. Um, but this appears to open up new, new prospects in China-Brazil relations. And I'm wondering, um, having spent a significant amount of time in, in Brazil, does China's closeness to uh, Brazil threaten U.S. interests, and if so, how? Well, I think what we're, what we're seeing in Brazil is a, uh, under the um, Lula 3.0, is an opportunity to regain space that they had given up in the diplomatic realm. Brazil has always been very active, and their foreign ministry very active uh, overseas, and it would have been significantly less so under Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro. So I think they're recovering a little bit. This is space for Itamarachi to recover. And let's not forget, of course, that you know, Brazil makes the B in BRICS. And, uh, and so there are some obligations there. I think the Biden administration has done an excellent job of building early bridges. I think there's, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of confidence placed in Lula early on. We usually don't do things that well. And so they paid attention. There's been some love. And that 
That's the reason why early, early, early in the administration he gets to visit Washington as part of um, uh, the Biden administration's efforts to, to build um, solid or rebuild solid bonds there. Now, um, I think the, the peace with China is, is worrisome in that some in the uh, Brazilian, um, in the Lula administration have already said and passed judgment that the visit in Washington didn't really amount to much. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I think you can see some projection there in that the Brazilians presented the Chinese with over three dozen um, agreements for signature. Now that reflects a little bit Brazil's penchant for you know, form over substance and the, and the love of you know, protocol. And you know, a lot of countries love to sign agreements, but at the end of the day, even the Chinese walk that back. And they're only gonna be 20 something agreements that they're gonna sign. And, and we've all seen these, you know, these are some agree agreements more significant than others. But I, I think what we're, we're seeing is a, re a reflection of the Brazilians uh, attempting to regain the space that they believe that they should have in the um, international arena. Okay, I wanna ask kind of a follow-up question that comes in from the audience. Um, how will the BRICS, and of course Brazil is the B in BRICS, how will their economic realignment translate into political realignment and, um, and there's been a couple questions that have come in on um, global, uh, the US dollar as a global reserve currency. Um, how will that political and economic realignment impact uh, the US dollar as a global reserve currency? That's outside of uh, my expertise, I would say. I would, what I would venture to say, though, in, in this is that, and um, uh, it's very intimidating to have uh, uh, Evan upstage next to you when you see the volume of things that he's written and the and really the ground he's covered That's what everyone goes to so I w what I endeavor to do is sort of add be um, between the gaps and in this issue on um, on um, China and Brazil is that Brazil provides all sorts of foodstuffs for China at a time where China needs you know everything from soy to beef to uh, cooking oils and those sorts of things, and it's very it's it's easy to explain, you know, that that part of the uh, economic equation. Brazil and uh, I'll, I'll add Argentina are well a well place to do that. And just to dovetail a couple uh, off of a couple things that that, that Juan said. Uh, so first of all, of course, uh, you know, Brazil um, within uh, South America has traditionally uh, seen itself as as part of kind of a, a broader global. Uh, order, uh, particularly uh, taking a look at, at Africa across the Atlantic, but but uh, you know, but in in a broader sense, we saw this uh, during the first Lula administration when uh, uh, Lula sought to position Brazil to broker a, a nuclear deal with Iran, with, with Turkey, of course, in play. And we're seeing it now, when much to the consternation of, of visiting a German, a German Foreign Minister Olaf Scholz a couple weeks ago, um, Lula basically said that he did not see an, any moral uh, you know difference or anyone particularly at fault in the Ukraine war between Vladimir Putin and and and, and, and Zelensky. Um, so. I I think what Brazil is, is trying to do, and we see it through, through BRICS, is kind of play to that sense of Brazilian exceptionalism bound to China exceptionalism. And, and I think uh, that was, was certainly part of the, the, the play that you know, once Lula recovers from his pneumonia um, will probably be part of, of the discussion uh, within, um, you know, w within that, that trip. And, and certainly the, the fact that uh, former Brazilian President uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff, although some would say that uh, Lula was trying to get Dilma out, out, out of town by appointing her to the New Development Bank, but I, but I think uh, with uh, with that, you'll see the increasing use of the BRICS as a vehicle that in some way is safer than bilateral, which allows China to project a common vision. And this is consistent with the doubling down on the kind of the South-South approach that you see with the Global Development Initiative. So I think we'll see more of that on the one hand, and I think you'll also see Lula as kind of the elder statesman among the Latin American left seeking to use the CELAC forum, which you know China now has an important seat at the table, to project itself in a non-radical way, um, but uh, you know, using CELAC as, as an alternative uh, to uh, the, the OAS and, and those institutions to have a more kind of Brazil-centric and, and non-US-centric you know, leadership model. And, and so I, I think we, we will see Brazil, um, and again, going back to the traditional kind of left orientation of Itamar Chi, uh, going uh, certainly in that direction. And then I finally point out that uh, uh, strategically, uh, when China thinks strategy, it doesn't just think military. China understands that uh, in a world in which uh, the U.S. and the West dominates global institutions, whether it's the IMF or the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera, um, and certainly a world in which the dollar is a reserve currency and the United States can borrow as much as it wants, uh, China is strategically disadvantaged. And so I think what you see with respect to the structuring of, of different commodity contracts, especially with Brazil in renminbi, in yuan, um, also the push for a digital renminbi, which again is trying to get it uh, uh, 
more accepted as an international currency. The push within institutions like the IMF to get the RMB accepted as part of the international reserve. All of those things are at least part of a long-term strategic effort to use its economic weight to position itself within a world financial system in, in a way which at least doesn't have to face the dollar from a position of, of disadvantage. And with growing Chinese weight, I think we'll, we'll continue to see that, that process continue. If I could add, you know, Chinese also have the advantage of it's not just participating in some place like Salak, which is doesn't have a U.S. It's an OAS without the U.S. Mm -hmm. But they participate in the OAS as observers, and of course, uh, they also are participants in the Inter-American Development Bank. So it gives them some space, and then it gives them more than some space. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I want to ask a question now. I want to, I'll direct it to you, Dr. Ellis, about. Um, Bolivia and the fact that it has one of the largest resources of lithium in the world. Um, and then I want to shift over to comparisons between superpower rivalries in, in the Western Hemisphere then and, and, and now. And um, China and Russia have moved fast to Bolivia, uh, as I'm sure you know. And I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts as to why the United States hasn't moved fast to, to Bolivia and, and what can be done. That's a great question. So, so I think historically, of course, uh, you know, Bolivia, um, you know, relatively removed from the U.S. near abroad. I mean, certainly the issues that have pressed us to take a, a greater interest in, in, in Latin America sometimes ag against our, our willingness to, to do so. Uh, Mexico, Central America, of course, the drug flows that come from, from Colombia and to a lesser extent to uh, Peru um, up to, to the United States, you know, that has tended to focus our, our attention more on that near, near abroad. Uh, Bolivia, which is strategic to, to South America, so I think has is, is continued to get, unfortunately, secondary at, at, attention. Um, however, as you also point out, um, you have have a broader series of, of strategic struggles uh, that aren't just about military affairs um, or aren't just about informational affairs, but about things like strategic minerals. Now, sometimes I think Bolivia is a little bit oversold because while it is true that um, the largest uh, amount of recoverable lithium, depending on, on the grade, is to be found in the southern part of Bolivia, you know, places like Salar de, de Uyuni, um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the Chileans probably do a better job in managing their lithium in, in the north there. The Argentines probably have the, the best system for, for getting lithium in volumes out now, and so in all three of those places, you have China making a part of the lithium play, but it's not just the extraction, but it's also the processing of lithium and the whole supply chain, and, and what worries me is, is sometimes that as of other strategic minerals like, again, niobium coming out of Brazil, you see that the Chinese are doing a pretty jo good job of positioning themselves throughout the entire processing supply chain. And even in places like, like Mexico, where in Bacanora you have Gang Feng, uh, again, positioning itself uh, you know, for, for that. And so I think the question with Bolivia, especially with the lithium but not exclusive to that, is the way in, in which uh, the, the Chinese um, really engage across Latin America in a patient way with governments that are, in some cases, less well institutionalized and in which the Chinese have certain headaches, but can get a lot of government-to-government -government deals, and also in governments which are more institutionalized, the Chileans, for example, where they can get more progress, but they have to do so in, in, in a different way. So the Chinese are engaging everywhere for a multiplicity of, of different region, reasons, um, and certainly Bolivia is one of those areas. Thank you. Um, we have a question actually specifically for Mr. Cruz, um, and I'm hoping it's from a student in my capstone seminar. Um, who <laughs> so um, Mr. Cruz expressed that Chinese development in degrading um, or aging infrastructure in Latin America and the Caribbean is important. In an effort to match or outpace China as a superpower, what is the feasibility of the U.S. becoming involved in Latin America and the Caribbean developmentally from a policy standpoint? Is it likely to see the United States even consider international development as a response to Chinese influence? Excellent, excellent question. Um, and, and what it goes to, and I, I think it's probably races us towards sort of the, what I would say is part of the conclusion of uh, conclusions that we could draw from tonight, is that the Chinese have been able to elbow themselves into the region and just and quite frankly outmaneuver us in a, in a lot of different ways. But part of the problem is that the Chinese presence, an increased presence, comes at a cost, but not at the cost of U.S. presence. We're absent in the region. Those of you who study Latin America know, and I can tell you in the interaction with other governments, they always raise their hand and say, you know, where, where's the United States? Where's your engagement? Where's your presence? Where are your loans? Where are your offers for infrastructure? And the fact is, Chinese soft power, and, and Evan's spoken about this, soft power and their abilities to influence, which is really what they're getting to, is, is uh, multiplies our own. The Chinese budget for um, what could be called public diplomacy, think of it as in terms of propaganda, is $10 billion a year. Let me say that again, $10 billion. The US, $2.5 
one billion. And so if we look at that and, and, we, and we see how the Chinese, I once had a senior member of um, the Ecuadorian government come to me and say, listen, where are the loans that the US used to you know, um, offer overseas and the opportunities to study in the United States and scholarships and where is that? And he said, in my own, he was an indigenous person, he said, in my own village, we have, I couldn't believe this, this is a senior official, he says, we have three dozen individuals from my, my village, not the country, my village, studying in China. And he said, we've never had a scholarship offered by the United States. Now, do you think these people wanted to go to China? That was their first choice? Oh, definitely want to go to China. And so they have to go to China, they have to learn, you know, your Mandarin, and they go into these programs. And, and this government official, quite concerned, says, what do you think this looks like now? This person returns, they'll probably do very successfully, enter government and maybe even run for public office, be in Congress, and the time comes to make a decision that's favorable or not favorable to China. Which way do you think this person's gonna go? And he said, that's just my village. And it's not a, it's not a preposterous story. We've heard versions of it before. And, and I myself wonder, where are our big programs that we used to have? This, um, in your introductory comments, you essentially bring us back to what is a, and I would support, is a new Cold War. Well, we know what the Cold War looks like, and we know how to win it. But we're not doing that. So I would offer that the, an the answer lies in engagement, in interest, and in investment. And we can't keep countering China's offers pointing to the DFC, which has insufficient funds, doesn't have all the authorizations, and that's sort of our defense for the China's the Import Export Bank or the Development Bank. That's, that's not the tool. Mm. And the answer ultimately, I'll have to tell you, is top down. So it has to be a decision that comes decidedly from the president and says we need to, right now we have a rarity in Washington, we have bipartisan agreement on China. We have the national security strategy, a 48 page document, which on, comes from the president, China's on 20 of those 48 pages. You have the national defense strategy, way too many pages, 140 something. <laughs> Second paragraph of the document, China. And if you read what it says about it, it basically says it's the number one uh, they don't use threat, but challenge. And if you look at the annual uh, threat assessment by the intelligence community, China's the number one country listed. So if we're worried about all this, and both parties agree, and you know, we look and China's eating our lunch in the region, why aren't we doing something about it? And that's a big question. Can I, I, I want to tease out your response a bit more, Mr. Cruz, with, um, with a question that came in from the audience. Um, and the, uh, the question is, um, could you elaborate on your opening comment that China is not a threat yet? Um, what are things that we could do to mitigate advancements of this threat in Latin America? Well, well part of it is I'm, I'm, of course, trying to be provocative and get some questions in. But the other one, and I think it's a disservice that's done, and is that we overstate the Chinese threat. And I see that time and time again when we cite things that the Chinese are doing that are, quite frankly, business as usual. And as difficult as we're trying to convince partners of a very serious um, issue. By the way, I, I spoke to, three weeks ago, to a very senior person in the administration who has met with 20 leaders in the region and China's always on the agenda. And he said, listen, they're not idiots, they know that China's a threat, that there's a problem. But it's not, they don't look at it from the white hat, black hat, good and evil. They look at it as access to interest-free loans and finance and development. And, and he said, it just comes down to dollars. Dollars that we're not providing and they need to get from somewhere. And so when you, you know, when you look at the issue of China, where they're coming, they're not a threat. I would say they're not a threat, but we're not well served. And what doesn't work is when we sit down, and it baffles me, but when we sit down, we talk to them about Sri Lanka, what happened in Sri Lanka. Guess what? I don't know one single incident where that's resonated with individuals that we've 
Graves, we gotta stop doing that. You wanna talk about something that'll work? Ecuador, perfect example. Show, show them, listen, not only are you an oil hostage to China through a very bad agreement, but also um, in their um, Coca-Cola uh, hydroelectric dam, the thing is riddled with fissures, making it unsafe with shoddy workmanship and bad construction. That's the poster child we should be putting out there, not the language they don't understand. And I think part of it is we're still struggling, and we're behind the, the, the ball here, we're still struggling to come up with that which resonates with the region where they don't say espionage, well, if it weren't them, it would be you. You know, oh, you know, it's a, and we need to find the vocabulary, and I think that that's one of those, right? Ecuador is a good example. We hold up the poster and said, this, you know, this could happen to you too, um, rather than those examples that don't work. I want to shift the conversation to more security and, and crime issues. And Dr. Ellis, there's been a couple of questions that have come in asking about whether Chinese or Russian crime syndicates have increased their activity in Latin America, and whether or not you or whether or not you could kind of comment on that a bit. I mean, are there any sort of threats of Russia, Russian or Chinese disinformation, um, cybersecurity? I mean, that's one of our big concentrations in the International Affairs Department here, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, first of all, with respect to uh, uh, transnational organized crime, um, certainly what you do see is uh, is one would expect with an expansion of the illicit, you have an expansion of, of the illicit. Uh, and part of the problem is that the way that that functions, because uh, most uh, Latin American colleagues have relatively limited contacts with Chinese uh, police forces or the Chinese government, uh, you have relatively limited uh, capabilities with with Mandarin Chinese, et cetera, et cetera, that um, the ability of, of Chinese illicit groups to maneuver in that that space um, is, is relatively high. And you see this across a range of, of different areas. And so um, you, you certainly see it with respect to, to drugs. And again, uh, in the process uh, from about 2001 and, until present, as different business people uh, made ties with different groups in China, different illicit organizations did as well. And so, for example, uh, the Sinaloa cartel, and to a lesser extent in Mexico, uh, Jalisco Nueva Generacion, that, that had actually some of the, the, the same roots going back to the millennial cartel days. Um, but uh, some of those ties with the Chaya, uh, Chinese triad organizations and others uh, initially trying to um, you know, e export their product to to uh, China and other places around China, but also uh, it, then uh, w with time importing precursors for things like um, you know uh, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine for, for methamphetamines, and of course later fentanyl, uh, much of which uh, came out of, of Wuhan. So you begin to see uh, that process imported, uh, um, especially uh, through through Mexico and then from Mexico to, to the United States. Um, but in addition to that, you saw, for example, in the mining industry, you um, you know, places like Madre de Dios, um, to, a, to a lesser extent the Llanos of, of Colombia, the interior of, of Venezuela, where you have, um, again, a, a process of, of laundering, but, but ultimately those products are purchased um, you know, by a different uh, faceless entities in, in China. So um, one of the other difficulties is you have increasingly a Chinese role in, in money laundering. And especially for Mexico, this has become a huge problem as you've had a significant penetration of Chinese banking, and especially retail banking, organizations such as ICBC, and to a lesser extent, China Construction Bank, among others. I mean, so as you've been doing licit business, it's become easier, for example, for Mexican cartels to take, uh, for example, bulk, bulk cash um, and to enter that bulk cash into the Chinese uh, system in legitimate ways um, in Mexico. And of course, once it's in a Chinese institution, the ability to, to, to track who owns that money and where it is, it becomes much easier. And so ironically, um, that has begun to supplement because of, of the ease and security, some of the more traditional kind of micro laundering uh, the types of things that, that went on. Um, and frankly, also in terms of trade-based money laundering. So again, um, you know, the use of, of bulk cash to, to buy certain things. Uh, oftentimes, you know, there was a, a famous a case a couple of years ago uh, that the DEA uh, publicized where essentially uh, Mexicans would uh, basically take their, their bulk dollars, they would, um, uh, they would uh, farm it out to uh, Colombian representatives who were actually operating in coastal China. They would actually make purchases in China. They would import it uh, into Cologne, and among other places, uh, being a being a key uh, you know, trade distribution hub. And then basically would would enter uh, in, in a laundered fashion um, you know, through 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 bulk goods. 
Um, and it goes to arms smuggling, it goes to other things, it goes to human trafficking uh, through uh, Chinese uh, communities, which oftentimes, again, you think uh, Latin American law enforcement organizations have relatively little capability in, in speaking Mandarin. Uh, try to find uh, you know, who has capability in, in speaking Cantonese or, or, or Hakka, which are, again, some of the, the more uh, you know, traditional dialects that those communities, Chinese communities in the Caribbean, you know, speak. And so, again, where there is, is shadow, it's, it's easier for those groups to move. So um, this is an increasingly emerging challenge that requires more coordination, requires different types of, of capability. Um, and then with the last part of your question, um, with respect to some, and I would be very clear that there is no indication that the Chinese government um, is actively seeking to promote organized crime as one of its tools. Um, they certainly are not in any hurry to help us solve the problem, and, unless it behooves them to do so. Um, but, you know, but again, this is something that is a part of China's advance, but not necessarily part of, of, of a nefarious Chinese plot. Um, but in terms of other things, uh, such as information operations, what you certainly do see is it's traditionally been the Russians, and this goes back to reflexive control operations that the Russians had known back from the Cold War. Um, but with new social media, what you really see is, is Venezuelans and Cubans really being more the on-the-ground presence, presence but, but Russian technologies in terms of bots and trolls and, and things like that, and also uh, connecting those to some pseudo-legitimate Russian propaganda arms like, like, like Sputnik and, and RT. Um, now, there has been an increased uptick in, in the Chinese using um, some of, of their capabilities, which is traditionally more propagandistic, a lot of resources through CGTN and you know, the, the, the buying of, 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 of ads and the supplying of, of free images and things like that to local Latin America. But what you've increasingly seen is, is little bits and pieces as is China's limitless friendship w w with Russia beginning to support the Russian message a little bit in the region, although to date you haven't seen the Chinese trying to use it in the same type of destabilizing, polarizing way that the Russians have used their own information warfare capabilities. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Mr. Cruz, I had a couple questions come in from the audience based on your, your most recent comments. So I think that your provocative comments are, are, uh, are mission accomplished. So um, the lack of engagement in the region by the United States government, what is the role for American private industry to fill the gap in Latin America? And secondly, um, what would you say to the argument that the United States is no longer offering loans or developmental aid to Latin America, America beca countries because it's simply too risky for uh, U.S. American actors? Okay, so uh, thank you. The, so how do you lure companies back to the region, especially U.S. companies that would, you know, that would like to maybe come back? And, and let's get back to the companies that left in the first place and why they left, because I think it's important to understand. So I asked, I asked these companies, um, and I don't, I don't feel comfortable naming them, but you know, you, you, those involved in infrastructure, primarily now in the Middle East and Asia. And I said, what was wrong with Latin America? And the number, the first issue they raised was corruption. Common, common, you know. Um, and they said, you know, unlike other countries, you know, we'll go to jail for what these folk are asking or what's expected from us or what we're competing under. We're, and we're highly disinterested in, in forming part of this. So, you know, the corruption th piece, and even if there is no corruption, then we go to part number two, which is trying to get paid. They say, ultimately, in these projects, we don't get paid, we don't get paid on time, and we don't get paid in full. And thirdly, the projects are simply not big enough. They're big for the region, but they're not big when you compare them to the big infrastructure projects in the Middle East and, and Asia. And I, I think today we could probably push back a little more on that because we are talking about bigger projects. But if you're the U.S. company, and that's what you have, a, a lot of problems, possibility of getting yourself in, in you know, sort of legal danger and competing unfairly, and it's not a lot of money, and they're not gonna pay you anyway, what a deal. And so that's, you know, I would argue that that's why you find companies like Odebrecht involved in what they did, where they did it, and how successful they were. It, was, it came a time that anything worth building was being built by Odebrecht, a Brazilian company, around the region. And that's why the Odebrecht uh, scandal, corruption scandal, uh, splattered on so many leaders in the region and so many countries in the region. And I think this is probably well within the comfort level of the Chinese to operate. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ellis, I had a question for you that came in from, from the audience. Um, and the question is, um, 
Do you think in any way or form that the Chinese are overextending themselves across the globe? And do we see any sort of impacts of this in Latin America? And I'll ask this maybe perhaps a, in a different way. Um, the way that we're looking at it, or the way that we see it depicted in the media, sometimes it appears that Chinese influence in the hemisphere is uniformly positive. And Mr. Cruz uh, um, mentioned that the Ecuador case. Um, but what other countries or areas of the region are pushing back against the expansion of, of Chinese influence, if at all? Sure. And this goes back to, to Juan's question, the, the idea that if we, in our, our Western uh, relatively short-term rationality, can't find a way to, to make money in a secure way, um, then if the Chinese are engaged, it's either because they're, they're stupid or there's some nefarious uh, plot. Um, and it also goes back to a secondary, I think, a deep-rooted belief, and I've seen this over the past 20 years that I've that I followed uh, you know, China's evolution, which is um, this this, this belief that um, something will magically happen, uh, whether it's the interior collapse of, of the Chinese system, because uh, you know, we, we talked about Evergrande and, and the, especially the, the, the retail sector, the dead overhang with, with local governments as well as the national government and, and the private sector, um, you know, structural contradictions uh, in terms of, of uh, demand generation, the healthcare system, uh, pollution, uh, you, know, you pick your, you know, the education system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think oftentimes there's a tendency uh, to, to cherry pick um, what are completely valid uh, problems that the Chinese are struggling through uh, and, and to underestimate the enormous amount of, of control and the adaptive ability that they have, and frankly, the, the fact that they are able to do things uh, differently than, than we do. So, for example, um, you know, many people assumed that they were you know, just being foolish in, in Venezuela. But in the case of Venezuela, the structure of the deal, and the same thing with Ecuador, was oftentimes through parallel contracts, actually short-term contracts, usually, usually a three-year line of credit, um, so that, that essentially um, uh, Chinese uh, companies would, would get uh, credit to do work. Uh, they would receive progress payments, but basically it would run up their account in, in a Chinese bank, the Ecuadorian or, or Venezuelans. Um, and then as Chinese companies, in, in the case of, of Venezuelan MPA3 with, with CNPC, um, in the case of, of Ecuador, it was Andes Petroleum, which uh, had a significant operations in, in, in the interior of the country. Basically, as they would take delivery on, on that oil, making a lot of money there, it would pay down the line of credit. So the bottom line is that the Chinese companies were, you know, if it ultimately didn't produce anything of value, the Chinese companies were, were still getting paid for their effort, similar patterns in Bolivia, um, and the money never left China. And so there wasn't a matter of, for example, Rafael Correa doing what he did with the IMF, saying, we're not going to write you the checks, because the only way to not get the Chinese paid was to basically physically stop them from pumping the oil that was going to, to repay those loans. Um, now, th there is, much has been said, and it's absolutely correct, that the Chinese are you know, horrible at traditional risk assessment, and especially at a time when you had near zero uh, per, uh, percentage interest rates, and money was basically free, and, and especially when there was a lot of, 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 of state backing uh, for the companies that had access to those lines of credit um, and the way that kind of Sinosure did business. Um, a lot of foolish decisions were made, and it, probably about 30% of, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative projects in Central Asia and other places are, are, are non-performing. Having said that, though, and it is true that there are a lot of unwise Chinese <coughs> projects that have not turned out well, but the irony is that the Chinese have still gotten paid for those things. It's oftentimes the local countries that have not received the the, the value added you know, for, for, for those projects. Um, and I think, finally, the, the thing that I would say on this is with respect to the US uh, policy response. Um, again, oftentimes there's this idea of we need to compete symmetrically. Um, in other words, okay, so China's providing money, we need to offer money. Um, the problem is that, that structurally we as a you know, fundamentally market-oriented economy with, with a democracy, we do not have the agility, we do not have for better or worse, the, the uniformity of voice. Uh, we do not have the ability to mobilize private sector capital in places where private sector capital does not want to go. And so um, some of the things that we're struggling with is, is um, you know, it doesn't make sense to compete with China necessarily on their own terms. And yet at the same time, um, you know, as I've wrestled with this, uh, what I've also come to believe is that we cannot abandon a value-centric approach. Uh, in other words, to, to not just convince Latin America that, okay, the United States will give you more money or, or a better offer, although so if we come to the table with nothing, you know, that doesn't work either. Um, but at the end of the day, in conjunction with coming up with the money, we also have a duty to um, show the Latin Americans that this is um, to their benefit, to come at this with strong institutions, to come at this with transparency, to adopt technical solutions that protect ind individual rights, not because of us, but because of, of, of them. But we have to do it in a way that's not imposing or, or preaching. We have to come up with the money, um, but we have to do a better job through 
uh, data-based and in a form, as, as one points out, um, not talking about Sri Lanka, but talking about Ecuador to the Ecuadorians, talking about what the Chinese have screwed up in Bolivia to the Bolivians. Um, but at the end of the day, it's convincing our Latin American kind of uh, counterparts that um, you know you may not get the benefits that you dream about. You may not be able to control the risks that you think that you can control. And at the end of the day, there are certain reasons that you want to have transparency in, in other things. So to me, that has to be the core of the approach, that that, that balance approach of, of money, but money coupled with values of what's in Latin America's interest. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Um, so we've come through this hour very quickly, and I want to ask a series of overlapping questions as sort of the the final question of, of the evening, and I'll pose the same question to you all, and we'll start with you, Mr. Cruz, but um, uh, it's around this question of whether or not we're entering a new Cold War, um, which I think that you might have mentioned in your comments earlier, and specifically, how is superpower influence in the hemisphere similar um, or different than it was during the actual Cold War? I mean, is this new Cold War, which you've seen as sort of on, on media headlines, is that, is that real? Um, and if that's the case, um, what is Latin America's role in this, this new conflict? And someone asked in the audience, I mean, is there any way that Latin American countries can sort of play these superpowers off of each other? And so that's, that's a lot um, right there, and we could probably spend a whole other hour talking about these questions, but by way of conclusion, um, I wondered if each of you might want to address um, aspects of the, that, those overlapping questions. I, you know, it's healthy and appropriate to talk about uh, something like a, uh, another Cold War. First, first of all, because it has all the trappings and feelings of one. So, you know, perception is reality in this, in this realm. And the Chinese are using a, a, a wide scope of tools to uh, conduct their influence and expand their trade and expand, and expand their presence. And, it, and at times, for these countries, it does seem like a zero sum. And what I would argue is that these countries very successfully navigated the first Cold War. And so the idea for them is, um, is to be able to, when I've asked these countries, what could make it more difficult for the Chinese in your space? And they said, one, to see the, just to, to see the US, the US um, engagement, but also they talked about rule of law and how difficult it was sometimes for the Chinese to, to uh, thrive, to exist and thrive in countries that had solid rule of law. And the difficulties that they had with labor laws and with environmental laws and those kinds of things that we all would want to hear. And so um, as the Chinese do buff their propaganda mechanism, we've talked about the investment they made in that, the investment they made across the board in, in scholarships and in opportunities. What I would say is that the Chinese are playing our playbook more than we are. These are exactly the kinds of things that we did during the Cold War and, and they're outdoing us. So first of all, I, I would say that uh, you know, this, is, this is not your, your father's Cold War. Um, so Clearly, what you, what you have is, is a competition, but by contrast, for example, to the Soviet Union, which sought to impose a, a political order in a way that was very symmetric to, to the United States uh, in, in terms of you know, an alternative system of values, an alternative system of economic or organization, and basically you know, funded insurgencies and other things to advance those goals. Uh, the Chinese pr principally pursue their own goals um, and uh, you know, try to, to adapt and engage to farther those goals through political uh, and also to try to farther um, the, or at least cover the anticipated consequences uh, that, we, that they believe that that will generate with, with us. Um, what that means is that um, it, it's very difficult for, for us to say, okay, well, the Chinese are trying to overthrow governments. Um, but the reality is what the Chinese oftentimes do uh, is, again, through providing resources you know, with no political questions asked, um, they change the trajectory of the region uh, and they, they provide alternatives that take us away from some of the dynamics that we would like to promote in terms of democracy, human rights, et cetera. Uh, I also agree that um, there is the perception that you know there is an alternative. What are you willing to offer? What are we willing to offer? And can't we just uh, you know hold out for for, for the highest bidder? Um, I, I would say that that presents a, a a false trap because and even the term competition in many ways may not be the most effective policy term because it, it implies you know first of all it's a competition. Um, 
for as opposed to a competition between. In, in, in other words, okay, who is going to give us the best offer? And Latin America is just you know choosing the highest bidder. Um, and what I go to back to, back at the end of the day is that the difference between the United States and in China with respect to Latin America um, is we are fundamentally attached to Latin America. In other words, by bonds of, of family, by bonds of geography, by bonds of, of you know, economic dependence, as we've seen through drugs, as we've seen through immigration. When things go well or when things go badly in the region, it directly impacts the United States in ways that it does not impact China. And so I think what that takes us to is a more asymmetric response, which is that the United States can't tell Latin America, um, okay, don't do business with China. Um, there are sovereign states that will be counterproductive and that will be ineffective. Um, what we have to do is fundamentally re recognizing the stakes. We have to work with Latin America to be a better partner because at the end of the day, it's things like pushing for transparency, which el eliminates, um, narrows the possibility for China to do those dirty deals that benefit the elites but not the Latin American publics. It's helping our Latin American partners to, to push for more effective project planning to make sure that what they invest the people's money in benefits them long term and not uh, just the latest bobble like you know the the you know the, the high speed train that uh, the Chinese wanted to build in Panama um, you have to uh, do a better job in evaluating contracts a technical you have to do a better job in, in evaluating um, evaluating risks of, of investment like we do with the CFIUS process um, you have to do a better job in not only controlling corruption but ap applying laws on, on the back end whether it's labor laws or environmental laws or, or other things um, and you have to make better um, data informed decisions in other words um, you know, a process by which saying, um, you know, we, you know, there, there are certain reasons why you want to do, you know, certain things um, with respect to holding out for these the, the, these values um, and the, the deal that looks attractive, um, that your elites want to sell that to you because you know their brother-in-law's sister's uh, company is going to make a lot of money off of the intermediation deal um, may not be in the long-term interest for you. And so, at the end of the day, to me, what it really comes down to is selling Latin America that we have a stake in the well-being of the region. We certainly have a long way to go w with that. Um, but it's about being a better partner and, and bringing prosperity and stronger institutions to Latin America together. Um, if we aren't convincing in that, and if we don't bring the resources and, and do that effectively, then there's nothing we can do to outbid China or, or outblock China that's going to be able to really allow us to prevail and, and keep this a prosperous hemisphere at the end of the day. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Um, I appreciate everyone's intelligent questions and your, your curiosity on this fascinating topic. We received over 45 questions and I regret that we couldn't get to all of them, but I am encouraged by the level of interest in this, um, in this topic. Um, and I also encourage you to come down and, and shake hands with the guest speakers on your, on your way out. Um, please continue to, to, to keep an eye out for us for the other side of the border where we focus on practitioner perspectives on uh, Mexico, the border, and Latin America, as we uh, and, you know, as we try to continue to to, to bring bring about unique and and relevant topics um, here at the Bush School. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, and if you'll please join me in giving our speakers uh, a round of applause. <laughs> and appreciate it.